Philippians chapter 4 is where you want to be. The text that uh, Charlie just read for us, Philippians chapter 4, we are going to zero in on verse 9 this morning. Now, if you were here with us last week, we pondered the significance of verse 8, where Paul commands us to fill our minds with spiritual realities. And, uh, and the word here that he uses at the end of verse 8, if you were here, he says, dwell on these things. We said that word is significant. We need to really understand that it's a word that does not just simply mean give it a passing thought. Uh, it means to evaluate. It means to think about. It means to contemplate it deeply. It means to consider it. It means to calculate it is a very strong word. Now, the why, why he tells us to fill our minds with spiritual realities, uh, well, there's a couple of reasons. One of those reasons we talked about last week. And that is, if we don't fill our hearts with God's things, then Satan is going to step in and he is going to take advantage of that vacuum. He is going to step in and exploit the situation. And we looked at that last week. We saw where that principle is taught all throughout Scripture. Uh, for instance, we saw it in Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse 43, where Jesus told that parable about a demon who's driven out of a person and goes looking for another host, and he doesn't find it. And he comes back to this empty place that he was, first of all, pushed out of, but now he finds it, finds it empty, and he finds it uh, even more conducive, not only for himself, but for some other demons as well. And so, he brings more demons to fill that empty space. And, and, and we said, so that's the principle that God wants us to understand. If we're not filling ourselves with God's things, Satan's going to exploit the situation. And then we see several places in the New Testament that we took at, a look at last week where uh, Paul specifically really talks about that. In, in places like Ephesians chapter 4 where he tells us uh, to put a strict time limit on our anger, don't nurse it, he says, so that Satan won't take advantage of the opportunity. Or where he talks to, to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 10 and 11, he talks about the importance of forgiving and if you don't forgive, Satan's going to step in and exploit that situation. We saw how it happened to Judas in John chapter 13 where uh, it said Satan entered Judas after uh, Jesus uh, identified him as the betrayer. His heart was so empty that Satan had filled it so thoroughly that Jesus uses that language of uh, possession. And so, why do we fill ourselves uh, with all these spiritual realities? Because we, want to, we understand that if we don't fill ourselves with good things, then Satan's going to fill it, our hearts and our minds and our lives with his things. But listen, that's not all. That's one of the reasons that we fill ourselves with spiritual realities, our minds and our hearts with spiritual realities. But that is not all. There is one more element. There is one more reason that is really, really important. There is one more part of this puzzle, one more part, one more piece of this puzzle, if you will, if we hope to reach our fullest spiritual potential and we want to grow into the likeness of Christ. And the other piece of that puzzle then is here in verse 9. Take a look at it. These things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. And so in verse 8, when he says that we are to dwell on these things, that we are to fill our hearts and our minds with God's things, he's not just recommending some kind of mere mental exercise. Remember what we also said last week when we talked about this filling our hearts. We said, uh, remember the principle of how a computer works, that output is determined by input. And so verse 8 is all about input. Well, verse 9 is all about output. And one of the reasons, and the reason here in this particular text that, that Paul wants us to fill our hearts with God things, 
is so that it will change our behavior and that it will change our lives. Uh, at the end of the day, when everything else is said and done, we have to understand that it's not enough to think like a Christian. At the end of the day, we've got to act like a Christian. And that's what verse 9 is all about. What Christianity comes down to is living a disciplined, obedient life for Jesus Christ. And that is what verse 9 is saying. Whatever you've learned, whatever you've heard, whatever you've seen, whatever you received, you put into practice these things. Now, I don't know what word your translation has there in verse 9 where the New American Standard says practice these things. But that's a good word. The, the English word practice is a great word that reflects the meaning of, uh, of the word that Paul actually uses. It refers to something that is done repetitively. Over and over and over again. It's something that uh, shows just continuous ongoing, habitual action. Uh, you know, there are certain professions we talk about practicing. You know, doctors practice. Well, they, they do the same things habitually, over and over and over again. Lawyers practice. They do the same thing habitually, over and over and over again. Athletes practice they do the same thing over and over and over again. I saw a cartoon somebody posted on Facebook this week. And I thought it, it, was, it was great for this particular lesson. It was, there were two chickens. It was like somebody drew two chickens. And, and one was like a little chicken and one was a big chicken. And the little chicken is learning the, the violin or the fiddle. And, uh, and so as he's holding his fiddle to learn how to play the fiddle. And he's obviously talking to the big chicken who's trying to teach him. And, and, and the little chicken says, I don't want to practice. Uh, he says, I, I want to just skip ahead to the part where I'm awesome. And I thought, yeah, yeah. That's how we think a lot. We don't want to do these things over and over and over again. We just want to get to the part where we're awesome. You know, I want to be a person of God. I, I want God to... Uh, I want God to be in God's approving love. I want to be a mature Christian. I want to be someone that God can use for His glory and honor. I want to be someone, that, an instrument, a tool that God can pick up and use to help other people draw closer to Him. I want to be that kind of person. Well, listen, you're never going to be that kind of person unless you do this unless you are practicing these things, unless you are habitually, continuously, repetitively living the kind of godly, disciplined, obedient life that He calls you to do. It's no wonder that this is in verse 9. This is the, this is the end of the matter. This is what it all boils down to, doing this. Now, that's what the Sermon on the Mount is all about. It's about, it's about acting like a Christian. Turn over there. Let's just kind of uh, look at that for just a second. Turn over to Matthew chapter 5. You've heard me say uh, a, a whole bunch that the Sermon on the Mount is all about kingdom living. That what Jesus is doing as he's beginning his ministry is he's showing us what life in the kingdom is supposed to look like. And what you're going to see it's all about acting. It's all about what we do. Uh, it's all about being something and doing something. Uh, you can just start, and we'll glance at a couple of places, like verse 16 of chapter 5. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's what kingdom life is all about. It's about doing something. Doing things that others can see that your life has changed and transformed and it just looks different because the things that you do are different. Uh, and people can see that. 
and it has an impact on them. Or you get down to verse 21, and what he talks about in verse 21, you've heard it said, don't commit murder, and then he goes on to say, but listen, here's what I say to you. Uh, and he talks about controlling our anger. See, that's what Christianity is about. It's about doing something. Uh, it is about our behavior changing and looking different. And then he goes on in verse 23 to talk about reconciling relationships. If you're presenting your offering at the altar and you remember your brother has something against you, leave your offering, go before, uh, before the altar and be reconciled to your brother. See, that's what Christianity is all about. It's about doing something. It doesn't end at believing something. It doesn't end at thinking something. It ends at doing something. Uh, you get down into verse 27. You've heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus says, but I'm going to say to you, it's more than just the act of adultery. And he talks about just sexual purity. The whole, he said, this is what, what Christians do. If you're going to be part of the kingdom of God, this is what kingdom people are required to do. It's doing that you, you are sexually pure. You honor God's plan for sex. That's, that's what you do as a Christian. It's not just you, you know, say you believe in sexual purity. You do sexual purity. Or you get down into verse 31. It was said, whoever sends a wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. And then he says, but I'm telling you this. You honor God's plan for marriage. You stay married. This is what you do. It's not just something you say you believe in. That it's great for people to remain married. This is God's will for His people. You stay married. Uh, he gets down in verse 38. You've heard that it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I'm telling you, whoever slaps you on your right cheek, you turn in the other. Uh, this is something you do. Uh, you don't retaliate when you're wronged. You, your behavior is different than the world. Uh, you, you don't retaliate. You get down into verse 43. You should, you've heard it said, love your neighbor. He said, but I'm telling you, you love your enemies. Uh, you're doing good for other people, all people, not just friends. All, but you have everyone's best interest at heart. And it changes your behavior, how you do things. Uh, verse 33, you've heard it said, you should not make false vows, but fulfill your vows to the Lord. And he goes on to talk about, no, no, no. What you do as a Christian, you're to be radically honest. This is the, a, a manifesto of kingdom life. And this is what he's saying. It's all about what you do. It's, what about, it's about, all about what you practice. And so it's no wonder that when Jesus finishes up the Sermon on the Mount, look at that, it's the end of chapter 7. Here's what he says in verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these words of mine and acts on them... See, that's what kingdom life is all about. It's no wonder Paul says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9, when he's pulling it all together, after he tells us, okay, you fill your mind and you fill your heart with spiritual things, and then he says, you practice them. You do these things. It's what you do. Whoever hears these words and acts on them is, is like the wise man who built his house on a rock. And then he says in verse 26, whoever hears these words of mine and does not act on them. So that's what Christianity is all about. That's what it boils down to. God wants to change us. That's why the input is so important. Because God wants the output to be a certain way. And the output's not going to be a certain way unless we get the input right. But the output is what God is looking for. It is about who we are and what we are every single day. And isn't that what James talks about? You remember what James talks about in James chapter 2? One of the more familiar passages in the book of James, where he talks about a, a faith that is worthless. 
And that worthless faith is in verse 14 of chapter 2. What use is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? That kind of faith that just talks about it, that says the right things, that thinks the right things. No, no, no. It's got to push through and do the right things. And he uses examples like in verse 15. If a brother or a sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace and be warm to be filled. You've done nothing. See, this is what it's about. At the end of the day, God wants you to be a practicing Christian. He wants you to be a practicing Christian. Now, let's go back to Philippians chapter 4 now, and, uh, and let's take a look at this. So what exactly are we to practice? This is important. What are we to practice? Look what he says in verse 9. Here are the things that you need to practice, that you need to be habitually all about. He says, the things that you have, first of all, learned. The things that you have learned in me. Uh, the idea of in me is really important. Paul's setting himself up as the standard. What we are to practice goes back to who Paul is and what he is. And it begins with things that have been learned from Paul. It's a word that refers to teaching. It is a word that refers to learning. It's a word that is often used in the context of, context of discipleship. In fact, the verb form of this word learned is, uh, is, is actually, the, the noun form of it rather is, is, is the word that's uh, the word for disciple. And so it's a word that means learning and teaching and discipling. You know, that's what Paul's ministry was all about. Over in Acts chapter 20, when he was talking to the uh, Ephesian elders, one of the things he said to them, he said, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you publicly and from house to house. That's what Paul did. He taught. He taught publicly. He taught privately. He taught one-on-one. -on -one. That's what he did. And so when Paul says, here's what I want you to practice in Philippians chapter 4, He's talking about the things that I taught you. These are the things that you practice. And then he says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9, the things that you have received. This is often used, this word is often used in the New Testament as a technical term for re revelation. Paul's saying, what I taught you, what you received from me, was revelation. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to show you where this word is used often and how you'll see it connected with the idea of God's revelation. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 23. We just got done eating the Lord's Supper. And uh, Paul is giving some instructions here. The Corinthians, as many of you know, they have just messed things up so bad when it comes to the Lord's Supper that you can't even call it the Lord's Supper anymore. And so he has to start over at the very beginning and just kind of set the foundation for him. And look what he says in verse 23. For I received from the Lord. That's the word that he uses there in Philippians 4 9. This is it. I received from the Lord that which I delivered to you. I got it from God, and now I'm giving it to you. And so when he says, you are to practice what you've received, he's talking here about revelation. Or you'll see it again in, uh, if you'll flip over to chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, he'll use the word again. As he's talking about the resurrection of Christ, look what he says in verse 1. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand. You received the gospel that I preached. What I preached was, was the revelation. Verse 3, for I delivered to you as a first important what I also received. I received it, Paul says, now you receive it. I received it from Christ, and what he received was that Christ died for our sins, he says there in verse 3, according to the Scriptures. Uh, turn over to 2 Thessalonians real quick. 2 Thessalonians, when you get over there, look at chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter, uh, chapter 3. Uh, 
Paul's going to talk to the church at Thessalonica about, uh, about Revelation. Tell you what, before we look at 2 Thessalonians 3, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You're going to see it there. Let's just start there. He says in verse 1 of chapter 4, Finally then, brethren, we request, we, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us instructions as to how you ought to walk and please God, that you excel still more. And look over into chapter 2 of that same book. For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, uh, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God. And so you have this repeated over and over. Paul is talking about revelation, revelation, revelation. Being received, 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 received. And so it's things that we've heard from Paul. It's these things that we've received from Paul. And uh, if you look over into 2 Thessalonians, as I said, in verse chapter 3, he says, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life and not according to the tradition which you received from us. Um, his instructions were, were God's instructions. What he was passing on was the will of God and the word of God and heaven's decisions. It's no wonder then that in Acts chapter 2, when we see the church come onto the scene, that it says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching. You heard these things from us, he said. You received these things from us. Now go back to Philippians chapter 4 and take a look at what he says. Another thing, he says, you, you learned these things from us, you received these things from us, You've heard these things from us. See, all of these things are talking about his role as an apostle. Uh, when he talks about hearing these things from us, uh, my mind goes to uh, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 where he's writing to Timothy and he says to him in verse 2, these things which you have heard from me, he says, in the presence of many witnesses, you then entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You heard these things from me. Now you've got to pass them on to others to teach. Things that they've, they've learned from Paul. Things that they've received from Paul. Things that they've uh, been taught from Paul. Uh, and then he goes on to say in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9, and that you've seen in me. Uh, he modeled everything that he taught. Uh, these are the things that we're to practice. These are the things that we're to do. As I said, we need to always just remind ourselves of what this book is. We need to constantly remind ourselves of that. Uh, that. That this is a book that ultimately God is the author, but He selected certain people to be the instruments through which He would reveal Himself to us, these apostles. And as I said a moment ago, when they gave instructions, when, when they made decisions, these were the decisions of heaven. These were the instructions of God. Uh, turn over to the book of Ephesians chapter 2. Let's remind ourselves of that, of just how important these apostles are. You know, you'll, you'll hear people say things like, listen, we worship Jesus, we don't worship Paul. You'll, you'll hear that. Uh, hey, now listen, we got to respect Paul or Peter, fill in the blank with one of the apostles. You'll hear people say this. We got to respect him. But listen, Paul wasn't Jesus. Peter wasn't Jesus. You, you'll hear things like that. Well, that's right. Paul wasn't Jesus. I... I Paul wasn't Jesus. Paul's not my Savior. I agree with that. Peter's not my Savior. I'll be the first one to go, Peter, Peter's not my Savior. I'll be the first one to say, yeah, Peter didn't die for me. I, 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 I will be number one in line to say, Matthew? John? No, 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 no. These guys aren't my Savior. I'll be the first to acknowledge that. I ain't going to fight anybody on that. But then I'll also be the first in line to say, 
Paul wasn't Jesus, but his words were Jesus's. Yeah, I won't forget that Paul's not Jesus, but don't you forget that his words are the words of Jesus. Don't you forget that. Don't try to hold up Jesus and Paul as, as though they're opposed to one another. And that, that Paul, we don't need to take him as seriously as Jesus. No, we do need to take him seriously because he was handpicked by Jesus. You remember his conversion story. Jesus appears to him and says, You're my man, and you're going to be sent with a special mission from me. And just like every other disciple that was handpicked by Jesus to be his spokesman, he was promised a special measure of the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit would lead him into all truth, and that when he spoke the things uh, when he spoke, he spoke the things that Jesus wanted spoken. Those were the words of Christ. Look, we just looked at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul said to the church at Thessalonica, we are so grateful to you, because when you received the word from us, you didn't receive it as the word of men. You received it for what it really is, the word of God. Or we could look at places like 1 Corinthians 14, 37. We've looked at that before, where after giving instructions for who could speak to the gathered church, Paul says, if anyone thinks he's a prophet, let him acknowledge. Any of those who have the gift of prophecy, he said in the church at Corinth, you acknowledge that the words that I am speaking to you, these are the words of God. And if anybody does not embrace them, then... Uh, then he's going to have to uh, uh, stand before God. That's basically what he said there at the end of verse 37. Uh, his words are the words of Christ. And if you look in Ephesians chapter 2, you'll see that, where, uh, where Paul is talking about the role of the apostles in the kingdom. And if you look at verse 19, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and of God's household. You belong to the family of God. And he says, you need to understand something about the family of God. Verse 20. God's household was, verse 20, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Wait a minute. What's, what do you mean built on the foundation of the apostles? I thought it was built on the foundation of Christ. Well, if you keep reading there in verse 20, it says, no, no Christ is the cornerstone. He is the Savior. He is the cornerstone. But, but the, the church is built on the foundation. There's a foundational role of the apostles and prophets. Now, who he's talking about when he talks about the prophets? He's talking about those who have the gift of prophecy. Uh, uh, the foundation of the church, uh, is, in other words, is the instruction that comes through the apostles. That's what it means. That's the foundation of the church. That's why when we come together 2,000 years after the death of Christ, we read this. That's why we do it. Because it's their instructions that are the foundation of who we are as the family of God. Uh, that's why I'm standing here today and I'm saying, hey, turn to, hey, turn to, Hey, turn to. Hey, look at this. Hey, read this. Hey, notice what this says. Hey, don't miss this word. Hey, understand the significance of this word. Look at this phrase. Let's unpack this. That's why I say all that. Because that's who we are. We're the household of God. And the household of God is built on the foundation of the instruction of the apostles. And so in practical terms, of course, this means the New Testament Scriptures. And, 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 and they speak to us, and we're expected to obey them. I mean, after all, we, we looked at 2 Thessalonians 3.14 already. We won't go back there when Paul says, Hey, listen, church, listen to me, he says. You notice anybody who doesn't obey the instructions that you receive from us, you notice him, 
you notice her and you take the appropriate measures and you exercise discipline on them, don't treat them as an enemy, he says. You exhort them as a brother, but you mark them who, who doesn't listen to the word that they've received from me. Uh, that's why Paul says, Philippians 4, 9. What it all boils down to is this. He says, listen. What you've heard in me, you do it. What you've received from me, you do it. Uh, what you've been taught, what you've learned in me, you do it. What you saw in me, you do it. Now listen, we say this pretty frequently, but it just kind of recurs in Scripture and we need constant reminders. I know we live in a culture that is increasingly anti-Christian. A culture that increasingly doesn't have any, any real deep, profound respect for uh, the things of God. That doesn't have the, the view of Scripture generally overall that, that culture once had. I, I know that. And so we're just going to increasingly, we're going to increasingly come under pressure. It, it can be intense at times. Because some of the things that we're going to believe and some of the things that we're going to do and some of the things that we're going to teach today are going to be so out of step with modern sensibilities and modern sensitivities. They just are. And, and, and we're going we're gonna to feel... The, uh, we're going to feel the pressure. <laughs> we just are. And, and so what do we do? Well, there, there's a, a lot of groups <clears throat> that, uh, that it's so hard, they just, they just kind of knuckle under. And they still kind of embrace the idea of being a follower of Jesus. But it quickly begins to adapt and morph into something that is a lot more culturally acceptable. I pray that you will never go there as a person, and I pray that we will never go there as a church. I pray that what we will always do is that we will practice the things that we have heard in Paul and the rest of the New Testament writers. That we will continually, habitually, over and over, practice the things that we have seen in Paul and the other New Testament writers. That we will continually, habitually, over and over, practice, do the things that we have learned from the Apostle Paul and the New Testament writers. Because again, at the end of the day, that's what God calls us to be. And that's what God calls us to do. It's not enough to talk like a Christian. It's not enough to think like a Christian. You got to act like a Christian. And a Christian embraces the apostolic word, a Christian embraces the New Testament scripture, and a Christian is sold out in practicing the things here. Let's pray. Father, as we think about your will for us as your people, we are so thankful that you have reminded us this morning that you expect us to put your word into practice. And I pray, Father, that we'll all individually and corporately as a church, that that will be our passion practice these things, to practice everything that you call us to practice, sexual purity, uh, marital fidelity, radical integrity, love for all people, non-retaliation, setting our minds on things above, being generous in giving, giving, 
controlling our anger, reconciling strained relationships, honoring your will for your church, that, Father, that we will be what you've called us to be, morally, ethically, doctrinally. Father, help us to be committed to that. Father, it is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Well, as we end, I want you to go back to Philippians 4. I purposely left this off until just now. Look at the end of verse 9. There is just this awesome promise that is attached to this. This incredible promise that is attached to practicing uh, the teaching of the apostles. Look at it. It's at the end of verse 9. Let's just read all of verse 9 as we end. These things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. You want God's abiding presence? You want His abiding presence? But that promise is attached to this lifestyle. God's abiding presence is conditional. It is conditioned on a complete surrender to Him. God's abiding presence is conditional upon a respect for who He is as our sovereign Lord and Master and completely surrendering to Him. That's where God's approval is lie, lies. It is attached beautifully to this promise. Well, if you want God's abiding presence, it begins with the apostolic word and the instructions we find there of how to enter into a relationship with Christ. How to receive the saving benefits of His work at Calvary. That's found in the apostolic word. It's, it's found right here. Paul taught it. Uh, we received it. Peter taught it. Matthew taught it. As they were speaking uh, the words of Christ, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's right here. And if you want God's abiding presence, here's where it begins. If you believe that Christ is the crucified and resurrected Messiah, you believe it with all your heart, then God calls you to repent, to, to surrender yourself to Him and say, Lord, I'm giving you my life, I'm giving you my heart, I'm giving you my mind, and I'm going to start living it your way. Uh, and, and then based on that commitment to give your life to God, to, to join Jesus Christ in the likeness of His atoning death in the waters of Christian baptism and be raised in the likeness of His resurrection. That's the apostolic word. That's what we've heard from the apostles. That's what we've been taught. That's what we've received. And, and they've told us that it's at that time and place God is going to meet you in your faith and He is going to wash your sins away. And so if you haven't done that today, receive the word. Receive it. And, and conform to that. We would love to share with you in that amazing moment where God is going to fulfill His promise in bringing you into His family. If you've done that, but you have wandered away from the Lord, you've become indifferent, you've become distracted, and you've just uh, given your heart back to the world, give it back to the Lord. And here's how you do it. The, the things that we have learned and been taught and received from the apostles make it clear. We can always come back. There never comes a moment when God is going to stiff arm us if we want to come back to Him. He's there waiting. And so all it takes, according to what we've received and heard and learned, is uh, we just come back to the Lord. So we're going to give you our lives again. We're going to give you our heart again. We, we want what you have given us. And we, we want again to have what you blessed us with in Christ. And we come back to you. And you will find radical forgiveness. That's what we've received from here. And so if you've wandered away from the Lord, come back to Him. And if you need to do that in a public way, 
please do that. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. And so if there's anything that you need to do to find yourself in God's approving presence, if there's anything that you need to do, any part of the Word that you need to conform to, do it right now while together we stand and while we sing. Amen.